today we're going to learn about how Romania defeated communism. I mean, how did they do it? Who was involved? Uh, and we'll learn some of the uh, details of what transpired that created this. Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts and Ting and Ting and Ting. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what we'll go on with this. Life in the world we live in is a complicated thing. There are numerous variables that make our existence truly unpredictable. However, there are three certainties in life that are simply unavoidable. Death, paying taxes, and communist governments collapsing. Romania is a Communist government aren't only the government, the only government that collapsed now, you know, so we, we, we could tell that uh, this is a showing that one side that's collapsed and all kinds of governments collapses, you know, that leads to dictators, that leads to sometimes better government or something like that. Let's keep going here. The country located on the crossroads of Eastern, Central and Southern Europe. It has always retained a unique character as it is a Romance language speaking country surrounded by Slavs and nomadic horsemen that lost their way on the road to Beijing. And the country and its people have retained this character throughout its history. As I was saying, as the country has always stood out as a sore thumb, there is no surprise that the fall of communism in Romania differed greatly from its neighboring countries. But to understand what made Romania so unique with itching Emily's she they ideology, we have to go back in time to the mid 20th century. But okay. before we do that, a message from our sponsor, Rate Punk. As someone who travels a lot, one of the biggest hurdles in planning my trips is finding cheap accommodation. It's no secret the hotel prices can vary significantly on different booking websites. Rate Punk is a free browser extension that scans all main booking sites and runs a live price comparison for the same hotels. It saves you a good sum of money and finds you the best deal by popping up in seconds. With Rate Punk, rather than spending an unnecessary amount of time listening to endless booking websites and trying to figure out which offers the best deal for you, you'll have more time to plan the important parts of your trip. There are no extra steps to do after the extension is installed on your laptop. Every time it starts working automatically, so after a while, if you forget you have it installed, it will be there showing you a comparison. It's available for your next trip. The story of the fall of Romania's communist regime begins with its rise. In 1944, as the Soviets pushed towards Berlin, they made their way into Romania, liberating the country from fascist rule. By the end of the Second World War, Romania fell under the Soviet sphere of influence, and most of the country's ministries were led by communist sympathizers. However, Romania didn't become officially a communist nation until 1947, when the then communist prime minister, George Georgiou Dej, forced the king of Romania to abdicate and proclaimed the Romanian People's Republic. The early days of communist Romania were mostly characterized by collectivization, political and religious persecution, and the thing left it to do best in fighting. During this time period, the infamous secret police force, the Securitate, was founded. Securitate. Ensuring the security of the Republic against internal and external enemies which, as you can imagine, resulted in many people being locked up in forced labor camps, being deported, resettled, or just plainly executed. Generally, the government under George Dej hadn't differed much compared to the other communist governments. However, things changed in 1965, after George Yu kicked the bucket. Upon the prime minister's death, he was superseded by previously irrelevant party official, Nicolae Ceausescu, who quickly Ceausescu. climbed the party's rank. Under Ceausescu, Romania started to take a different turn. The country became more open for economic collaboration with capitalist states, and Western media was allowed to be broadcast within the country, albeit heavily censored. As Ceausescu put in motion programs of de-Russification in the effort to distance the country from USSR influence. Although on paper Ceausescu secured Western capital and new foreign investments, 
The situation for the average Romanian citizen was less than ideal. Neki volt elég ítéle, hogy volt a hétköznapja. In the 60s, because of a declining birth rate, the government decided to outlaw abortions and birth control in an effort to boost natality within the country. Although the plan was successful in achieving what it aimed for, many children that were born during this time were back. It's, 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 it's kind of ironic that they said during a so-called communist regime that uh, they ban abortions whereas here they one of the things that I hear a lot of people say as some politicians but not a whole lot of politicians what I hear them say is that abortion is part of communism you know what I mean <laughs> so I guess what what these polytricksters do is they feed to the people certain things that would uh, certain things that that's affecting the people at the time they instigated but in other instances things that uh, doesn't fall into that category they instigate that and that's crazy it's, it's all politics like we see at home you know what I mean let's keep going with that by their parents and put into orphanages many of which were underfunded and lack capacity to take care of so many children. Thus, many were forced to live on the streets with no one to take care wow. of them. Alongside that, many women died as a result of getting illegal abortion procedures done. During this time, minorities within Romania were also subject to discrimination. Under the Ceausescu government, many Germans were forcibly deported from their homes in Transylvania to Germany. Alongside this, wow. Hungarian majority towns and cities received an influx of ethnic Romanians from the countryside who were forcibly moved to the cities in an effort to sway the demographic picture of the country. However, arguably one of the worst policies of the Ceausescu era was the forced industrialization policy. Throughout the 50s and 80s, Romania's economy on paper was grown and even superseded many Western European economies such as Spain's and Portugal's, which, uh, let's be fair, isn't that hard to do. However, most of this growth was forced as resources were artificially pumped into the industrial sector, taking away from the people. Although Romania was generating a surplus of energy resources, such as petroleum and electricity, much of it was being exported out of the country, alongside food and industrialized consumer products. So much so that the people of Romania were forced to ration resources. Yes, yes, I like the Wow. Buses within the country were forced to use methane as a fuel source because of which they received the title of bombs. Electricity was mainly diverted to the heavy industrial sector to the extent that only one in five streetlights was kept on. TV only broadcasted one channel for just two hours per day. Wow. And at the same time, Romania also had a high field crop. Yet, Ceausescu instated a food rationing program. The country was constantly undergoing a shortage of available goods. With the government promoting guidelines on how to eat nutritiously while reducing calorie intake by 25%. Most of the available food products were export rejects, as most of the quality goods were exported abroad in an effort to pay off the national debt and increase further industrialization. Wow. All these policies combined led Romanians to have the lowest standard of living in Europe, with the exception of Albania. So you know, things were pretty bad. Yeah. Throughout the late 80s, anti-communist sentiment was growing throughout the countries. One of the first anti-government protests that emerged within the country happened in 1987 in Brasov, as many workers within the city started to riot. Two years later, another protest emerged within Cluj, as a slew of university students took to the streets, demanding reform from the Ceausescu's. Both of these protests were shut down, and the protesters were arrested and beaten by the police. Well, okay, so one of the questions was, you know, who 
instigated the, 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 the takedown of, of this regime. And uh, it's, it's looking like it's like the masses did it, everybody did it, because uh, first the first uh, demonstration was uh, workers and stuff like that, and then the college students came in. And uh, in a situation like that, they didn't say if colleges were free. Uh, let me know down uh, in the comment section if colleges or, or school and universities were free at the time. Because if they weren't, and it's like here where you have to pay high price to go to college, then it was probably more than, it was more than likely middle class college kids that were fed up of the of what they're seeing, which is the reason why here, and that's what I try to keep telling people, they don't want you to go to college because in college you'll have some idea of uh, of uh, of wanting you know better circumstances to live under. If you if you don't get a good education and, and the high school education is like downtrodden here a little bit, you wouldn't understand how to go about doing that. So they're gonna tell you how. So in essence High school is just pumping out worker bees. Universities may or may not pump out people who would think about how things are with themselves. You know, not that the uneducated uh, poor poor people aren't thinking; they just wouldn't know how to go about making those changes, except for what they tell them they could do to make those changes, and in the meantime, crushing whatever you know things they try to do to make those changes. You know, and yeah. However, the revolution officially. I, I tell you what, uh, he's talk they're talking about the secret police on my island before all of the revolution in 1979. They're purported to have a secret police. And anybody who. Uh, went against the government at the time, ruling by, uh, the name of the party was the Grenadian, uh, G-U-L-P, I think, Grenada United Labour Party, yes, by E.M. Gary. Anybody who went up against him would get beaten. And how I know about this, uh, you know, my father was a policeman, an actual policeman on the island, and he was purported to be one of the secret police. And I remember my brother, who was part of the young, you know, rebellion type, my oldest brother, that is, we would always know when daddy's coming home because he would be climbing in because if, they, if he was caught hanging out on the side of the street with other young people they'd get attacked and that's what that's what I was told my brother would come home run jump in the bed to make sure my dad didn't know he was out there talking to other troublemakers you know what I mean so yeah we had our show of secret police uh, vibe on the island but that was before and it wasn't a communist government it was just an ordinary uh, parliamentary system government there, and he was voted in. Let's keep going. It began on December 16th, 1989, in the third biggest city in Romania, Timisoara. The day seemed as if it was going to be like any other, except there was one irregularity within the town. A group of people was congregating, forming a human shield around one ordinary looking building block. Within the building, surrounded by the people, lived Laszlo Tukic, a Hungarian pastor. Over the past couple of years, Tukic was speaking out against the program of systematization, where the Ceausescu government deemed many rural towns and villages as irrational and would demolish them and wow. force the population to bigger cities. Many of these towns were home to many historically and culturally important churches and buildings as well as the majority of the villages listed were populated by Romania's minorities. Thus, Tukic was an avid oppositionary of the program and often addressed it in his sermons and spoke about it in the Hungarian press. As you can imagine, the government wasn't too happy about this and ordered Tukic to be deported into the countryside. 
However, the pastor refused and many of his supporters came to his rescue and stood outside of his building to protect him from government attempts to forcibly remove Turkish. As the Romanian government increased its effort in getting hold of the pastor, the crowd outside of his apartment grew as many passerby started joining the gathering. The mayor of Timisoara tried de-escalating the situation by stating that he will overturn the decision of Turkish's deportation. However, after failing to provide proof that he has done so, the crowd started to chant anti-communist slogans and spread throughout the city. The police were deployed and suppressed the protesters using tear gas and water cannons. However, the next day the riot continued. The number of protesters on the street of Timisoara was too great for the police to handle. Thus, the military was deployed to deal with the issue. <laughs> Suddenly, the streets of the city were plunged into chaos as bullets flew down the avenues and cars became lit up like Boy Scout bonfires. Wow. On December 18th, the atmosphere within the city was dense, as soldiers and Securitate agents populated the Uniri Square. The city was under martial law, and curfew was in place, prohibiting anyone to go out in groups of larger than two. However, despite this, a group of young men headed for the Orthodox Cathedral of the Square, where they stood up and waved the Romanian flag, from which they had cut out the Communist coat of arms, while also singing patriotic songs. Upon the soldiers seeing this, they opened fire on the men, killing some and injuring others. Wow. The next day, workers en masse boycotted going to work and congregated at the main square in Timisoara, numbering in over 100,000, where they continued to chant anti-government slogans. The government, already starting to panic, sent out a delegation to try and calm down the situation and try and meet some of their demands, such as freeing the previously arrested protesters. On December 20th, with the protests continuing to grow in power, the Ceausescu government employed groups of workers from Oltenia to go and fight the protesters in Timisoara, providing them with weapons and instructing them to retrieve order into the city. Yeah, here's another, that's another parallel to... to uh, we have a, a, a day, at, I believe it's called Bloody Monday, where uh, groups of, uh, of uh, I, I call them hooligans, uh, charged a protest that was happening in our city uh, with machetes and, and, and sticks and stuff and was beaten and what we call on the island plan arson which is hitting people with machetes and stuff like that and uh, uh, the government just deployed them and I remember seeing them coming down the street where I live because there was a, a window watching the protest and I mean there were some angry men you know glistening in the sun eyes as red with anger as they start attacking people and stuff like that so you know we were, and the island didn't have a military at the time, so they had to employ these secret police slash hooligans to do their, their bidding and stuff like that. That's, isn't, it, isn't it crazy how parallel the human race react to oppression or, or, or being uh, oppressed to the point where, hey, we got to get up and we have to do something. And another thing too that, that, that happened, you first you had the workers protesting, then you had the students protesting, and now religious people got, in, got involved with it. So that's like a, 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 a big, a wide range of uh, people in the, in the community who is absolutely going up against the government there, you know. He, he had to know at that point that he's, he's, he's losing. He's losing. However, upon reaching the town, the Altinian workers decided to join the crowd. The same day, Ceausescu gave a speech on national TV, condemning the events at Timisoara and calling it the effects of external aggression. The next morning, Ceausescu decided to hold a public gathering within the capital of Romania, Bucharest, to give off the image that the country still vastly supports him. The government deployed thousands of workers from the city into the main square and provided them with red flags and pictures of the dictator. As Ceausescu came onto the stage, and started giving his speech condemning the happenings in Timisoara, expecting the crowd to cheer, most of them stood silent with blank stares, until all of a sudden, a couple people started to boo, and then a couple more, and more, and suddenly, wow, look at his face, the dictator of the communist country right in front of him, even chanting, Timisoara, 
in a panic, he tried telling them that he was going to raise all the wages. But the crowd just grew louder. They don't believe him. the commotion, several loud explosions started to be heard, and soon after, gunshots. The Securitate opened fire on the crowd and chaos quickly started to unfold as the entire event was being broadcast on national television. More and more people started to come out onto the streets, and soon enough a riot erupted right on the streets of Bucharest. As the capital plunged into chaos, the military took to the streets and suddenly the avenues were flooded by tanks and armored vehicles shooting at the unarmed riders. The fighting continued well into midnight when the situation finally calmed down once more. On December 22nd, just as the sun started to rise, the protesters once more started flooding the streets. Again, the government proclaimed martial law and instituted a curfew, but to no avail. In a last-ditch effort, Ceausescu came out onto the balcony of the Communist Party's headquarters building and tried addressing the people, but he was only met with disapproval and angry shouts. As the crowd started to become more and more unhinged, they were able to break into the headquarters and overpower the guards and make their way up to the balcony. But just before they could reach it, a helicopter came from out of the sky and scooped up Ceausescu and his wife Elena. Oh, As the couple headed away from Bucharest, they received the transmission via the helicopter's radio. It was the National Army, and they demanded that they land lest they be shot down. Wow. Thus, afraid for his life, the pilot of the vehicle landed them in a field near the town of Pitesh. In a panic, the couple managed to secure a car and drive off to a nearby agriculture center where they hid. But a couple of hours later, the two were discovered and arrested by the local police and taken away to a nearby military garrison where they would await their trial. Three days later, on the 25th of December, Ceausescu and Elena went to trial within the Extraordinary Military Tribunal. The couple were facing charges of genocide, subversion of state power, offense of destruction of public property, undermining a national economy, and trying to flee the country with misappropriated funds. The two were facing the death penalty right in the eyes. However, despite this, they were provided with legal counsel. Their lawyer, seeing no possible way of defending his clients, suggested they pleaded as mentally insane to at least avoid the ultimate penalty. However, Ceausescu found a mere suggestion utterly insulting and dismissed him. During the trial, that lasted around one hour, they argued that the tribunal itself was unconstitutional and that the entire thing was an organized coup d'etat by the Soviets. During the trial, the couple's lawyer abandoned them and joined the prosecution's side and started listing their crimes alongside them. All in all, the entire procedure was a mess. There was no criminal investigation prior to the trial, the accusation of genocide was never proven, there was no file of evidence presented to the court, and no financial accounts were found with misappropriated funds. Ultimately, the two were found guilty and sentenced with the death penalty, which was to be carried out 10 minutes after the verdict which also was prohibited against the law, as all death penalties had to be done minimum 10 days after the verdict. And although the Ceausescu's were entitled to an appeal, neither of them received it. In the end, both were executed so quickly that the media couldn't even televise the event. Over the next couple of days, fighting within the country continued despite Ceausescu's death. It is estimated that anywhere between 1,000 to 7,000 people fell as casualties throughout the revolution. Eventually, things calmed down as Ion Iliescu took office. What's interesting about the revolution, even though it was successful in bringing down Ceausescu, most of the communist leadership continued to be in power. The communist party that had ruled Romania up to this point renamed and rebranded themselves into several other parties, and thus, the end of an era finally came to Romania. I don't know how, how I feel. I feel so free, so happy, so, so hopeful, especially. I huge hopes I have. And yeah, that would be the Romanian Revolution. A revolution that took down one of the most infamous dictators in world history and freed Romania from the evil clutches of communism. I don't want to see something like that in all my life. I hope you... I, I, uh, I watched a video here recently about Romania, uh, somebody traveling in Romania, and uh, I think it's called Bald Guy. He's a British guy, and uh, he was talking to some Romanians and how hopeful they are. It might not have been him. It might be someone the uh, channel was watching. And they still have this hope that, uh, you know, things are going to keep getting better and keep getting better. Uh, 
people don't understand when how how it is when there is a especially people who live as in this country here they don't understand how it is to live in a country where all of a sudden there is a political unrest to the point where there is riots in the streets that is that is it's so out of control it's so so chaotic there's no no structure no organization of anything you know what i mean Luckily, I'm from a small island. It was pretty much well structured when we had our first revolution. Our second real revolution was really crazy because it was a deputy prime minister uh, going after the uh, the prime minister at the time and executing him. You know, by pretty much by a firing squad, T took him up to a place called Fort. At the time, they were calling it Fort Rupert, but the original name is Fort George. It's an old British fort, I think, built in the 1700s or something like that, and they executed him there. But uh, I don't think people here could fathom the idea of that happening and I think that's why they're so eager to do that here like they did the January 6th thing you know it's, if it's not organized the innocent people are going to die like crazy of course my country is a small population so not many people die you know died during our first revolution our second revolution was kind of a crazy day because it didn't last long four days and then America invaded but uh in order for a country to change, you gotta switch up everybody, you know what I mean? But they switch up, they got rid of him, and the same people who are working with him end up being part of the politics. So it's, it just still remain politics, you know what I mean? And uh, it seems like, you know, from all the videos I've watched here in Romania, not what I watched the reactor, but that I've watched, you know, they, they stand to be more hopeful, especially the younger generation and things like that. And I hope uh, you, we learn something there. Now, I, uh, I, I knew about all of this, uh, you know, but not into the detail. If you want to dispute anything that was said there, please comment down below and let me know what's up, you know. And like I always say, no fighting, no arguing. Let us just, you know, discuss this stuff here, you know. What we're looking for is this, peace. No utopia or nothing like that. You know what I mean? Because there's natural disasters, there's death. There'll never be no utopia. But peace, we could have peace while we live our day-to-day -day lives, trying to make our ends meet and stuff like that. I'm from the third world. We struggle a lot down there to make ends meet. But we still have the peace and the happiness. We still find that, which anybody could find that. You know what I mean? If they look towards it, they think. But... Uh, if you uh, learned something here or you enjoyed my reaction, uh, please subscribe. Like I said, leave a comment, drop a like on the video for me and thing, you know what I mean? You all take care of each other, all right? Oh, oh before you even say that, I leave videos here uh, of more reactions to Romania that you could go uh, take a look at, okay? And uh, please, please take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.